Good afternoon. Thanks again for everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I always ask, so if you could please silence the cell phones, you could avoid the, uh, the interruptions. Uh, my name is Mohammed Mohammed. I'm the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. Uh, and on behalf of our board and our staff, um, it's a pleasure to welcome you here as always. Uh, and it's also a pleasure for everybody watching online. Thank you for joining in. Um, it's also a great honor to introduce and welcome back uh, our distinguished speaker, Khaled Al Gindi. Uh, he's been here many times, and it's always a pleasure to have you. So thank you, Khaled. Uh, Khaled, <coughs> excuse me. Khaled today is going to be speaking about his latest book, uh, which was released just last month. It's called uh, "Blind Spot: America and the Palestinians from Balfour to Trump." The United States has invested billions of dollars and countless diplomatic hours uh, in the pursuit of Israeli-Palestinian peace and a two-state solution. Uh, yet American attempts to broker an end to the conflict uh, have repeatedly come up short. Two irreducible factors stand in the way, and those are Israeli power and Palestinian politics. American peacemaking efforts have been hobbled by the US assumption that a credible peace settlement uh, could be achieved uh, without addressing Israel's vast superiority in, uh, in power or internal Palestinian uh, politics. While there is no denying the roles played by Israelis and Palestinians in perpetuating their conflict, uh, Washington's distinctive blind spot uh, to Palestinian politics and Israeli power has prevented it from serving as an effective peace broker. Uh, shaped by the pressures of American domestic politics and the special, uh, special relationship with Israel, the blind spot also has deep historical roots dating back to the 1917 uh, Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate over Palestine. <coughs> the size of the blind spot has varied over the years uh, and from one administration to another, uh, but it is always present, as we all know, uh, unless and until U.S. policymakers are prepared to act in ways that constrain Israeli power and acknowledge Palestinian politics American peacemaking stands little chance of success. Uh, so the copies of the book will be available after the event, so please um, please purchase one on your way out, and I think Khaled will have time to sign them as well, so uh, please do that. Uh, and just for those of you who are, may not be familiar with Khaled, he is a non-resident fellow in the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution and the author of this newly released book, Blind Spot, America and the Palestinians from Balfour to Trump, uh, which was published by Brookings Institution Press in April uh, last month. Uh, he was a resident scholar at the Brookings Institution from 2010 uh, to 2018, where he focused on the Middle East peace process, uh, Palestinian politics, <coughs> democratization in the Arab world, and related subjects. Uh, prior to arriving at Brookings, Khaled served as an advisor to the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah on permanent status negotiations with Israel from 2004 to 2009, and he was a key participant in the Annapolis uh, negotiations from 2007 to 2008. Uh, Khaled has held a number of political and policy-related positions in Washington, uh, both inside and outside, gov uh, outside of government, including as a professional staff member of the U.S. House of Representatives International Relations Committee in 2002, and the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom from 2000 to 2002. He has also held positions at the Arab American Institute uh, and the National uh, Democratic Institute. Uh, Khaled's writings have appeared in a wide range of publications, including the Christian Science Monitor, CNN.com, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, the Los Angeles Times, the National Interest, the Washington Quarterly, and others. He is frequently quoted in the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Hill, Politico, and other print media, and is a regular commentator on TV and radio, including Al Jazeera, BBC, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, uh, NPR, PBS NewsHour, and others. Uh, Khaled holds an MA degree in Arab Studies from Georgetown University uh, and a BA in Political Science from Indiana U uh, University Bloomington. Uh, 
Uh, today, Khaled will speak for about 20 or so minutes, after which we're going to have a Q&A session and discussion. Um, as always, I ask please wait for the mic to come to you uh, so that everybody online can hear you. Uh, and also, please keep your questions, questions and to the point so that everybody has a chance. Uh, and for the online audience, you can tweet your questions to us to our Twitter account, which is at Palestine Center. Uh, please, everybody, join me in giving a very warm welcome to Khaled Al Gindi. Thank you, um, Hamad, and to all my friends in the Palestine Center. It's a pleasure to be back here, um, and thank you all for for being here. Um, since Hamad basically summarized my book, I don't really need to say anything. <laughs> so. <laughs> I have very little to say. Uh, I'm just joking. I actually have a lot to say. Um, uh, so much, uh, in fact, that I, I, I wrote a book about it. Um, I thought I would start, sorry, is that too loud? A little bit, okay. Um, I thought I would start by defining what exactly is the blind spot and, and where does it come from. Um, so let me, bef by way of, uh, of answering that question, let me kind of zoom out to um, generalities. I think we all understand intuitively uh, that the success of any negotiation process depends as much on factors outside the negotiating room as whatever happens inside. Uh, we all know, for example, that power dynamics are very important. Um, e clearly, uh, the more powerful side has more leverage over the weaker side, has more options, uh, and so forth. Um, and I think we also understand intuitively that both sides have internal politics. Uh, and that is to say that when we're negotiating, when you're negotiating with someone, you're not simply negotiating with the people sitting across the table. You're si also negotiating, and they themselves are negotiating with their political opposition, their public opinion, um, their national narratives. All of these things are also at the table. Um, so an effective mediator has to juggle all of these moving parts um, to be able to come up with ways to encourage the two sides to behave in ways that support the goals uh, of the peace process and to avoid actions uh, that harm the peace process. That's the theory, that's the, uh, that's the ideal. Um, but it's not at all how American mediation worked. Um, the tendency by the United States has been uh, essentially to, uh, to treat the parties as co-equals, um, as though they were Egypt and Israel, for example, uh, sitting around the negotiating table, two sovereign states talking about how to effect a withdrawal from the Sinai Peninsula, uh, where there's some parity, even though there's always going to be a gap in power and a balance of power, there is at least parity between two sovereign states. The reality, of course, is that not only are Palestinians not a sovereign state, um, but they are under Israeli occupation. So the tendency has been uh, for U.S. policymakers to downplay the effects, and then especially the negative effects of Israel's occupation on, uh, on the peace process. Um, on the other side of the equation, in terms of the internal politics, I think we all know that American politicians tend to have a enormous sensitivity and deference when it comes to Israeli politics. We can't push the Israeli prime minister too hard on a settlement freeze because it will bring down his ruling coalition and so we have to carve out these loopholes to allow settlements to, you know, allow them to continue building settlements. Um, we can't have Jerusalem on the agenda in the negotiations because so-and-so from the cabinet will bolt. So there's enormous deference to, to Israeli politics. And in contrast, um, there's virtually no deference to Palestinian politics. It's, it's as though Palestinians don't have politics. Um, and that's sort of how I came into this, uh, into this project, really. The, uh, the um, aha moment for me was when I was a, a, an advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team in the lead up to the Annapolis negotiations. In that moment, in the summer of, or early fall of 2007, when President Bush announced uh, that he would convene this conference. It had, uh, President Mahmoud Abbas had been in power for 
two and a half years. He'd been agitating for a return to permanent status negotiations virtually from the day he took office. And yet there was no process except, um, there was no uh, return to negotiations except in this moment. And what was interesting about this moment uh, was that only a few weeks earlier, um, uh, Hamas had taken over the control of the Gaza Strip, had routed the PA's forces um, after a brief civil war uh, in the Gaza Strip that Mahmoud Abbas and his um, Fatah dominated forces had lost. And a year before that, um, his Fatah party had lost an election to Hamas. And so here was the Palestinian leader in his absolute weakest uh, in terms of his domestic political situation, and this was the moment. It was very striking to me that this was the moment that American, um, the American administration decided would be the opportune moment uh, to move forward on negotiations. <clears throat> this, this approach to the peace process, of course, is not accidental. Um, uh, the American approach uh, to the Israel-Palestine conflict is shaped by its own power and politics, um, specifically two key assumptions. The first is that peace can only happen if Israel feels secure militarily, politically, and otherwise. We need to reassure Israeli leaders so that they can, quote, take risks for peace. That's been one of the operating assumptions of the Oslo process really since uh, the early 1990s. And the other is the assumption that it's possible and in some ways desirable to insulate the peace process from Palestinian politics, either by ignoring Palestinian politics altogether or perhaps even reshaping or re-engineering Palestinian politics to fit the needs uh, of the peace process. Um, as Mohammed mentioned in the bio and as I discuss in the book, this approach has deep historical roots and the blind spot goes back to um, it goes back to the time of the, the Belfort Declaration. And the reason I spend so much time on the history is because I think, um, I'm not gonna delve into um, a, a lot of the history except to make a, a couple points and kind of shed light on why I chose to look at the entire um, 100 year period as opposed to say just uh, since 1967 or since 1948. Um, and, and the reason is because I think there's an extraordinary amount of continuity um, in, in how the United States approaches the Palestinians uh, and, and Israelis, uh, primarily because it has always kind of seen the, the issue through a distinctly Zionist slash Israeli lens. Um, and so we can identify three constants throughout this whole 100 year period. The first is, is an influential Zionist lobby, politically. Um, that's always been true. The Zionist lobby in the 1920s was nothing like APAC or a pro-Israel lobby today in terms of its power, its reach, its influence. Um, uh, but it was there and it was, it was a political force. Uh, the second constant is related to that is you have a very sympathetic Congress. So Congress was always sympathetic to, uh, to the demands of the Zionist movement even when it was a minority strain within the American Jewish community. Uh, which is which is interesting to note, um, and it was a minority strand really until the Holocaust, until um, uh, until the early 1940s or late 1930s. <clears throat> the third constant, and I think this is in, in a lot of ways the most important, is a highly conflicted executive. Um, what does that mean? Well, usually that's manifested in a kind of tension uh, between the State Department and the intelligence community on the one hand. Uh, and the White House and the President uh, on the other. And so we have really a, 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 a pattern where U.S. policy is kind of in tension with itself. Um, there is um, a tendency to take positions both for and against the same thing at the same time. And so from, from the very outset during the mandate, for example, we saw uh, the official U.S. stance um, uh, with regard to the situation in Palestine was that this was a British matter. The United States was officially neutral, um, did not take sides, and yet we saw consistently President Wilson and his successors, as well as Congress, consistently expressed very vocal support for the Zionist project and the, the, the Jewish national home. Um, uh, so that, you know, that ambivalence, I think, is deeply 
uh, rooted in, in American history. Probably the most famous example of this ambivalence is Harry Truman, um, who before 1947 was against partition, uh, partitioning Palestine, uh, because the State Department and the CIA thought it was contrary to US national interests, uh, that it would alienate uh, the Arab states especially. Um, and then he was for partition, uh, and then immediately after the outbreak of civil war in Palestine following the partition vote, uh, he was against partition again. And then of course he was for it. And so there's this constant flip-flopping, but we also see it in uh, other manifestations at, at various stages as well. Um, one example uh, is the, the roadmap. The United States wrote the roadmap um, on behalf of the quartet. And the quartet adopted this as, as its peace plan. Uh, but then it immediately abandoned the roadmap. So we have this, we always have this tension between, between what is seen as in the US interest, um, based on an assessment usually of State Department and the intelligence community, uh, and then uh, the demands of, uh, of domestic politics which pull US policy in a different way. And so we get this very schizophrenic, very often US policy. And, and that has a lot to do with, uh, with US policy failure. The other trend that emerges in this period is very early on we, um, we see a distinct aversion to Palestinian politics, both political actors and Palestinian political aspirations during the mandate, but especially in the period after Israel's creation, the period between 1948 and 1967, uh, was a crucial period. I think it's one that is very often overlooked, but um, it, it's, it's the period when the U.S. approach to the Palestinians and their political leaders uh, were, were put in place. So even before 1967, even before 1968, when, when the, uh, the PLO was taken over by uh, Palestinian guerrilla groups, Fatah being the dominant one, um, you already have uh, a State Department policy in place that we will not deal with the PLO um, even before the PLO was part of the quote unquote armed struggle. So a lot of these policies just get carried over into, uh, from one period into the next. Um, like I said, I don't, wanna I don't wanna dwell too much on, on the historical part, but one of the most important um, aspects of, of, of the historical period, and again, why I chose to look at uh, the entire 100 year period is um, is the period after 1967, because this is when the PLO really registers onto the scene. This is when American uh, policymakers begin to see that there is in fact a Palestinian dimension to the Arab-Israeli conflict, that it's not strictly a conflict between Arab states and Israel, and that Palestine and Palestinians are at the root of that conflict. So there's a kind of um, uh, epiphany that happens uh, after 1967, and especially after 1973. Um, and in that period, you have the PLO uh, dramatically rising in its stature and its prominence. In 1974, the PLO is officially recognized by the United Nations. Um, and this creates a dilemma for American policymakers because they don't want to deal with the PLO, both because, the P because of Israeli rejection of the PLO and any manifestation of Palestinian nationalism, but also because People like Henry Kissinger, who is a staunch Cold Warrior, see the PLO as a Soviet puppet and as, as a radicalizing force uh, on the Arab states and therefore uh, very problematic and needs to be neutralized. Um, and so he institutes this, his, his sort of worldview is that, that the PLO is likely to radicalize Arab states and so if they're going to be brought into the peace process, which hopefully they won't, um, it needs to be at the very end of the process uh, after they've been weakened. And so this concept that Kissinger introduces is very important for future, uh, for, to understand how Americans go about the peace process because um, this, this principle of the PLO as a negative force and, and Palestinian politics as a pathology, um, something that uh, needs to be corrected and cured um, rather than acknowledged uh, and, and dealt with, is one that figures very prominently thereafter. Um, uh, so from there, I'm gonna skip right, o right into the Oslo process and talk about the most important part, um, which, is, which is really how this blind spot worked in practice. Uh, 
um, in, in, in the context of US-led peace process since 1993. Again, these same themes keep cropping up. Um, every US administration since 1993 has worked both for and against the goals of the peace process at the same time. Um, I gave some examples uh, uh, like the roadmap. This was not out of ignorance or malice, but basic political arithmetic. Um, the United States and Israel have a close special relationship. Um, they are also the two most powerful parties in this, in this dynamic, whereas the PLO and the Palestinians obviously are the weakest party. Um, and as close allies, they have an interest in deflecting as many of the costs and risks associated with the dip diplomatic process as they can away from themselves uh, and from each other. And what ends up happening time and time again is that those costs and risks are pushed onto the Palestinians, because mainly because of the power dynamics. Um, and uh, I'll give some examples. The other component of this, and by you know, has to do with the the nature of the Oslo process itself, which wasn't simply a conflict resolution process like Northern Ireland or. Um, Egypt Israel negotiations. It was also a state building process um, where one party uh, was being prepared for, uh, for statehood um, and therefore needed to build its institutions and, and so on. Um, this led to what I refer to as the Oslo trade off. The Oslo trade off was basically an unspoken agreement between the Palestinian leadership and the Americans as the chief sponsor of this process uh, that uh, from the Palestinian side, the expectation was that the United States would deliver Israel, eventually leading to a Palestinian state. This is a, um, a policy or a strategy that emerged in the 1970s, sort of banking on US deliverance um, as, as the road, as the key to Palestinian statehood. And the other, f the other side of this equation from the Palestinian standpoint was that in exchange for um, the United States giving up or the United States putting pressure on Israel and eventually to leading to uh, an end to the occupation and allowing the creation of a Palestinian state, in return, the Palestinians were prepared to give up a degree of control over their own politics and decision making. The PLO, as you will remember, is now transferred out of the diaspora from Tunis into the West Bank uh, and Gaza Strip um, uh, directly under uh, occupation. And so what this has done, the Oslo process has given, for the very first time, the Israelis and Americans, as well as the broader international community, a direct say in Palestinian politics, which hadn't happened before. Um, and so this is the dynamic that emerges after, uh, after Oslo. Um, and so it's not entirely a US problem or US deficiency. There is Palestinian agency here, and, and this is a conscious decision on the part of the Palestinian leadership to give up a measure of control over its own politics as part of that Oslo process. Um, as I said, every US president worked both for and against the goals of the peace process at the same time. President Clinton, I think, to my mind, um, stands out really as the one who represented both the best and the worst of what American mediation uh, had to offer. Uh, on the one hand, he shattered taboos. He invited Yasser Arafat to the White House, the first American president ever to receive this um, arch terrorist, um, Yasser Arafat at the White House, something like a dozen times over the course of the Oslo process in the late 1990s. Um, he occasionally would use his leverage uh, to boost Arafat, uh, particularly in the, after the election of Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in 1997. Uh, and they had a very contentious relationship, Clinton and Netanyahu. Um, and uh, we all remember that famous visit by Clinton to Bethlehem in Gaza, where um, he addressed the Palestinian public. And so he, I think, understood better than any president before or since some, uh, the need to, to boost the Palestinian leadership given, given the power disparities uh, uh, with Israel. At the same time, he was also the first president to seriously erode uh, US policy and UN, pres and UN president uh, in a major way, specifically on issues like settlements in Jerusalem, um, but also on issues like refugees. So he was, for example, the first uh, 
uh, U.S. president to not ratify or not uh, vote in favor of UN Resolution 194, which um, from 1948, uh, that stipulated that Palestinian refugees have the right to return to their homes. Um, so he ended the practice of, of, uh, uh, of affirming that resolution. Um, and he also kind of created these carve-outs for the first time uh, on Israeli settlements. Um, you could go ahead and build in the settlements for things like natural growth, build in East Jerusalem, uh, and, and so on. And so that was the first time um, we saw major erosion on, on policies on, on settlements in Jerusalem as well. But I think Clinton's biggest contribution came after the Camp David uh, summit of July 2000 uh, and subsequent to that, the outbreak of the Palestinian uprising, the Al-Aqsa Intifada in, uh, in September of that year. Uh, even though all sides made mistakes, and I think it's clear from the record, whether you're looking at Israeli, Palestinian, or even American sources, that all sides made mistakes going into Camp David and coming out of Camp David, um, and uh, that both sides, Israelis and Palestinians, took actions that sort of led to an escalation of violence, uh, and yet the Clinton administration pinned all of the blame for the, pal uh, for the failed Camp David summit on Arafat and the Palestinians, uh, and then um, also uh, put most of the blame in terms of the violence on, on the Palestinians uh, as well. Um, we understand why, at least I understand why uh, he did that. It's much easier to blame the Palestinians than it is to blame the Israelis in terms of our domestic politics. Um, but uh, there were uh, repercussions nonetheless. And one of, uh, among the, the repercussions were uh, the fact that doing so narrowed the political space available to the leaders in terms of trying to find um, uh, a successful um, to trying to negotiate a, a, a peaceful resolution in the remaining period uh, that Clinton was in office. Um, and it also emboldened opponents of the peace process. And most of all, it cemented this narrative that the Israelis put forward that the Palestinians were not a partner. Um, and then we get George W. Bush, who comes in uh, in the midst of a Palest very violent situation on the ground, a Palestinian uprising. Um, increasing suicide bombings, um, growing Israeli repression, uh, very often amounting to uh, war crimes according to many human rights groups. Um, so on the one hand, um, we have sort of an intensification of this, of this dynamic. Uh, Bush is even more conflicted than his predecessor. Um, and the Bush administration represents very much a return to the Kissinger notion uh, of Palestinian politics as pathology. Um, so on the one hand, uh, Bush was the first president to officially call for the creation of a Palestinian state. He made the two-state solution official U.S. policy. At the same time, in the context of the Intifada, um, Bush also gave Sharon a relative free hand to systematically destroy the Palestinian uh, Authority and its governing and security institutions under the umbrella, of course, of, of fighting terrorism. Um, on the one hand, Bush demanded that Palestinians have to elect new leaders and end the violence uh, before there could be any hope of a diplomatic process, but actually did nothing to push for a diplomatic process after uh, Arafat uh, passed away and Mahmoud Abbas was elected president, which also coincided with uh, an, end of, uh, an end to the uh, Palestinian uh, uprising uh, in 2005. So even though we have this reduction in violence and a new leadership, there's still no political horizon um, on the table. Most telling of all was the roadmap, um, the quartet uh, peace plan that was uh, really spearheaded by the United States in 2003, which was supposed to correct the flaws of the Oslo process by laying out a parallel and mutual uh, you know, parallel obligations for both sides and mutual accountability. Um, instead, the Bush administration, as I alluded to earlier, abandoned its own peace plan uh, in favor of uh, Prime Minister Sharon's uh, unilateral Gaza disengagement plan. Uh, the failure of that plan, the failure of the Gaza disengagement, eventually weakened Mahmoud Abbas's leadership uh, and, and led directly to the outcome of the uh, elections uh, Palestinian elections that were held in early 2006. 
And, and this was really, I think, the biggest test for the United States, um, the election of Hamas that took place in January 2006, like the Intifada, was a sign of a very troubled peace process uh, and an opportunity for course correction. Instead, the Bush administration, again, demanded that all of the costs be paid uh, by only by the Palestinians. And so we saw this boycott of the Palestinian Authority uh, undermining the very institutions that the international community and especially the United States had spent years trying to build up, especially after uh, the Intifada. <clears throat> um, as in any similar circumstance, when you put sustained pressure on a fragile object, it tends to break. And that's precisely what happened with the Palestinian Authority. We had a civil war in 2007. Uh, and then, of course, we had the Annapolis negotiations uh, that I um, alluded to at, at the outset, uh, which, of course, uh, also collapsed uh, in, in late 2008 when fighting broke out uh, between Hamas and Gaza. <clears throat> that brings us to President Obama. Um, by this time, by the time Obama came to office, the peace process, uh, both the peace process and Palestinian politics were in shambles. Um, uh, and what they needed more than anything else was a radical, a radical new approach that would either correct or, um, uh, or at least arrest all of these negative trends. Um, we had the destruction, the massive death and destruction that took place in Gaza, 1,400 Palestinians killed, massive destruction to Palestinian infrastructure. Uh, we still had a very divided and dysfunctional Palestinian leadership. Uh, very shortly after Obama took office, we saw the return of a right-wing uh, Israeli government under Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who was very committed to settlements. Um, and uh, in the intervening years since Oslo, we saw massive growth in the settlement project overall. Um, Obama was genuinely, I think, in a position to reverse or at least arrest these trends um, and perhaps even break some new ground. But he consistently chose instead uh, to sort of maintain a holding pattern, to do as little as possible um, that he could get away with uh, politically. And so there were attempts at negotiations, um, but more or less ignoring the most Im important realities on the ground, like ongoing settlement activity, the, the divided and dysfunctional Palestinian leadership, uh, the instability that came from that uh, in Gaza in particular, the fact that Hamas is a free agent beyond the scope of the peace process and now beyond the control of the Palestinian Authority uh, and therefore could consistently act as a spoiler. Um, all of these things were things that Obama initially hinted at uh, trying to change, but he quickly abandoned. Um, so when he first took office, he talked about a comprehensive settlement freeze. Um, if you remember, George Mitchell was appointed as a special envoy uh, for Middle East peace, uh, I think on the second day of Obama's, um, after his inauguration. Um, and, and it looked like the Obama administration was gonna take a very, very different approach. They would close these loopholes that previous administrations had allowed on things like settlement growth. Um, Obama even hinted at some sort of change with regard to uh, Gaza policy. But at the end of the day, when he got pushback from, um, from Congress uh, in particular and from members of the pro-Israel community, but, e but even within his own administration, there were some, uh, uh, there were some dissent there, um, he basically abandoned the effort, uh, went back to the old loopholes. Israel can continue to build in Jerusalem, natural growth, all of these kind of um, carve-outs that previous presidents had done, and Gaza was sort of left to its own devices, uh, really until, uh, until 2000 and, uh, 2014. <clears throat> By the time Obama begins his second term in office, uh, there really is no peace process. The idea of a peace process really exists uh, only uh, in name, and uh, for example, despite the success of uh, Prime Minister Salam Fayyad's state building uh, and institution building project, which brought corruption uh, to an all-time low, improved uh, 
the efficiency and governance of the Palestinian Authority, dramatically you know, reformed the security services in a way that led to a massive reduction in violence against Israelis. There was not a parallel reduction in violence against Palestinians, however. Um, and yet, despite that success, we saw no movement toward ending the occupation uh, or a Palestinian state. In 2014, we saw another attempt at negotiations that again collapsed, followed shortly thereafter by renewed violence, again in Gaza, uh, and also in Jerusalem, which interestingly enough are also the two areas that were both outside of the scope of the peace process. They were excluded from, from this process for various reasons. Um, and outside of the reach, beyond the reach of the Palestinian Authority. So it's not a coincidence that they are also uh, the main sources of instability. Um, and so by this time, the state building project has collapsed, negotiations have collapsed, violence uh, has become a recurring phenomenon. And so we really have neither peace nor process. Um, you know, we used to talk about the peace process was all process and no peace, um, but by this stage really, there's not even really a process to speak of. The parties are simply left to their own, uh, own devices, um, and the administration is, is sort of a bystander, even at this stage. <clears throat> even as the clock wound down on the Obama administration with a president-elect Donald Trump waiting in the wings, um, here was another opportunity to do some, take some radical step to bookmark the two-state solution, to move the ball forward, um, since we already knew quite a bit about the inclinations of the Trump, uh, the Trump, uh, the incoming Trump administration. Um, some people had speculated that maybe Obama would put forward final status parameters that would include issues like Jerusalem um, to sort of put a pin in a, in a, in a Palestinian state with, a, uh, with the Jerusalem as its capital. But he didn't do that. Uh, some also suspected that maybe, just maybe, he would uh, recognize a Palestinian state, uh, perhaps as a last-ditch last effort. He also did not do that. Instead, what he did was, again, the absolute bare minimum of what a president could do, which was to um, uh, approve an abstention at the United Nations, his first, first and only abstention. He's the only president to abstain only one time in a resolution against, uh, against Israeli settlements or, or other Israeli actions. Um, uh, and so it allowed, it was an important resolution, uh, and it was allowed to pass the Security Council uh, as a result. But that was the absolute minimum that could be done. And so then we have, we come to Donald Trump. The inertia of the Obama years left the door wide open for Trump and his administration, which as we now know, is much less committed to a two-state solution and is much more committed to radically changing the rules of the game. We've heard a lot of talk about Trump's peace plan. Um, my view is that the details actually don't matter of Trump's peace plan, uh, which keeps getting delayed, kind of, you know, they keep kicking the can down the road. Um, but it actually doesn't matter if the plan is released or it isn't released because we know the broad outlines already. Uh, we know that Jerusalem is off the table. Those are the words that, that Trump used. Uh, we know that refugees are also off the table because we've canceled, well, Clinton, um, had already sort of taken the issue off the table, but Trump put the final nail in the coffin of the refugee issue by defunding UNRWA, which had been um, a policy in place uh, even since, uh, since Israel's creation uh, in 1948 and 49. Um, we know that their policy does not include a sovereign Palestinian state, much less a capital in East Jerusalem. Instead, uh, what we uh, what we hear is that the Palestinians will get some form of expanded autonomy uh, and, and probably the infusion of some massive economic assistance program, most likely from, from Arab states. In a very real sense, though, um, Trump is not a new approach to the peace process, um, as he very often uh, tries to claim, but the culmination of the old approach. Uh, so Trump is no longer committed to the land for peace formula enshrined in UN Resolution 242. Uh, we saw that most recently in the announcement with regard to the Golan Heights. Um, but the basic ground rules of the peace process and the land for peace formula had already been eroded by presidents uh, before him uh, repeatedly, specifically by Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush. Um, the current administration doesn't recognize 
the occupation. They've scrubbed that term, occupied territories, from the official lexicon of, of the State Department and, and, and official reports. Um, but already for years we've seen U.S. administrations uh, downplay the significance uh, and centrality of Israel's occupation. And even, frankly, the Democratic Party uh, refuses to, to acknowledge, uh, uh, at least in their 2016 um, platform, uh, declined to talk about Israel's occupation. At the same time that the Republican Party had removed any reference to the occupation and in fact referred, um, uh, sort of entered a new realm of occupation denial. Um, this is the new rhetoric of the, of the Republican Party is grounded in a denial that Israel is in fact an occupying state at all. Um, and so we see these policies reflected in in, uh, in the statements and actions of the current Trump administration. Um, but even things like the, the move of the embassy, the American embassy to Jerusalem, uh, and the closure of the PLO mission, very dramatic um, departures from past US presidents, these were laws that were passed in the 1990s, uh, and that finally uh, were implemented or came to fruition um, in uh, under uh, under Trump, so there is a lot more continuity than change, I believe, uh, in terms of uh, the the Trump administration. In my opinion, the Trump administration is trying to redefine the conflict and its resolution by turning back the clock, not to the pre-Oslo period before 1993, um, but to the pre-1967 period and perhaps even pre-1948 period. Uh, when the Palestinians were viewed mainly as an economic, humanitarian, and a security problem rather than a political one. The bottom line, and I will end here, is that the Middle East peace process failed under U.S. management because it was fundamentally detached from reality. It was more focused on things like reassuring Israel and reforming the Palestinians uh, than it was uh, on challenging the basic conditions that define and sustain the conflict, namely Israel's now 51-year-old occupation. Um, we see this in the failure to uh, implement any sort of accountability, particularly when it comes to the stronger party, uh, Israel. We see this uh, in the absence, um, sorry, uh, the absence of pressure on Israel did not make uh, Israeli leaders more likely to, quote, take risks for peace, but instead defrayed the costs of its occupation in military, economic, and political terms. Likewise, attempts to neutralize or re-engineer Palestinian politics um, did not, uh, did actually make Palestinian leaders more pliant, uh, but also uh, made them too weak to serve as effective peace partners. Thank you. Michal, thank you so much for your presentation. I looked at your book and for everybody who hasn't read it yet, please get a copy because <coughs> it has some great insight, especially with Khaled's uh, experience with everything. So please grab one on your way out. Uh, so we're gonna take some questions now. Uh, Hi Khaled, uh, Mitchell Putnick uh, from Rethinking Foreign Policy. Um, this is, I mean, I certainly agree with every word you said. Um, no, no contention there. The, the, it sort of leads to, well, what do we do about that? And, and the obvious answer, I think, for a lot of people is you sort of look at Europe and hope that the European Union could step in and, and do something that the United States is just not going to be capable of given its special relationship. That obviously has not happened. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, do you think it's the same sort of dynamic that you describe in your book that, that prevents that? Um, or is there something different that's going on with, with uh, the Europeans that makes them an unviable alternative here? Do you want to take a couple at a time or do you want me to take one by one? It's up to you. Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> um, I mean, there's a little bit of that. I mean, the Europe historically has been slightly more even-handed in its approach. Uh, they've been more committed, at least rhetorically, to principles of international law, um, things like the 1967 border, things like um, settlements, uh, Resolution 242. These are things that uh, 
at least from a rhetorical standpoint, Europe has been much more consistent in, in trying to adhere to certainly than the United States. The United States has always tried to find ways around its own peace process, which is, <clears throat> which is a, a key cause of its, of its failure. The Europeans um, uh, don't have the same domestic political dynamics uh, that the United States has. I don't think any country has anything comparable in terms of the Israel lobby, and including Israel, by the way. I think you can, uh, I think there are things you can do in the Israeli Knesset that are simply unimaginable in the U.S. Congress. Um, <clears throat> but that's a different story. I, I think it comes down to power. I, I think the Europeans, because the United States was a superpower and because it was the chief sponsor of the process, because it had that special relationship with Israel and therefore uh, was the only country seen as being able to have any influence with the Israelis, the Europeans were more than happy to defer to the Americans consistently. Um, and the Europeans have their own kind of ambivalence where they complain about the Americans monopolizing the peace process uh, and that they want to be players and not just payers, um, particularly during the George W. Bush era when they got sidelined in the context of the quartet. But time and again, what we've seen is the Europeans complain, but ultimately what they really want is for the United States to, to kind of carry the water um, uh, on the issue, and then they're happy to sort of recede to the sidelines. In fact, that was how the quartet was created. Um, it was created as a way for the United Nations and the European Union, who were deeply anxious um, uh, and, and to a certain extent the Russians, who were so anxious about the escalating violence on the ground in the early 2000s with the Intifada, uh, and the Bush administration was more or less disengaged from the process. So the quartet emerged as a way for these international actors to impress upon the United States to bring them into the process. And once the administration did come in, um, they sort of went back to their, you know, to the back bench. Um, I don't see Europe as a, as a viable alternative to the United States. I don't think there is any viable alternative to the United States. I don't think that there is, there is no, I, you know, it's, it's kind of unsatisfying, but we have no peace process. We have no alternative to a peace process. We have no American mediation. We have no alternative to American mediation. We're just kind of in this limbo um, where realities are being, uh, where outcomes are being dictated by realities on the ground. Um, and it really is just about uh, who can create new facts on the ground. And I think that's where the Trump plan comes in, which is really not about changing facts on the ground, but about normalizing and legitimizing facts on the ground and doing away with that tension that you had before between the principles of the peace process uh, and, and the facts on the ground by, by just getting rid of the principles. Um, and so now the focus is on we got to deal with reality. Um, that's the that's the new vernacular of this administration, um, and so we have a. Uh, there are no rules, and I think this is one of the key problems to the Trump administration's approach from a, an objective standpoint. Is okay, you want to have a radically different approach? Tell us what it's based on, and they haven't done that. They've only told us what it's not. Um, it won't be a two-state solution. It won't probably won't involve a Palestinian statehood. Um, but, but, you know, they certainly haven't laid out some new framework. Um, what is it based on in terms of principles? Is there something, is there an agreed set of uh, uh, principles that, that all sides can agree on? Or is it simply might makes right? Um, and it looks more and more like it's simply kind of rubber stamping a might makes right situation. But, but you know, the answer to your question is I don't see an alternative um, uh, really until I think, I think the key impetus will have to come from the Palestinians. Uh, until we can see a credible Palestinian uh, leadership on the one hand, but, but more importantly, a vision and strategy that can replace uh, the failed strategy of, of, of Oslo, I don't think we're, we're, we're gonna see any real movement. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to follow up on this gentleman's uh, question to a certain extent. Uh, one factor is that the Arab Spring is really not over. You have a much more educated uh, population in the Middle East, and 
the leaders of the countries that might be willing to strike a deal that Israel would like uh, are going to have to proceed very cautiously because they could have a lot of domestic problems on their hands. Secondly, uh, I'm not sure I agree with you that uh, there is no alternative to the United States. Uh, Prime Minister Abbas, or President Abbas, has called for the internationalization of the negotiation framework. And let's take a look at Russia, which has excellent relations with Israel, but also has excellent relations with Iran and with every state in the Middle East, including uh, Hamas and, uh, the, uh, and Hezbollah. Uh, they certainly could be a player, uh, and China. And this is all occurring at a time when the US is no rea not really able to call the shots as much as it could in the past. So in this context, and also domestically, I think you see in the Congress, it's, I'm not talking only about uh, Ilhan Omar and uh, Ms. Talib, but uh, Palis there's considerable support for the Palestinian position uh, on the democratic uh, side of the uh, aisle. Uh, so the dynamics are changing as well as, to some extent, public opinion in the United States. So please comment, it's a broad question. <coughs> Yeah, it's a, there's a lot of questions there. The, 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 the first point on the Arab Spring, I didn't quite, I didn't quite get. Well, I mean, uh, look at what's happening in Algeria. Look what's happening in Sudan. Uh, there's a lot of <coughs> very well-educated uh, population that is not going to give uh, leaders of uh, reactionary and authoritarian types of uh, Arab states the ability to <coughs> uh, other countries uh, while ignoring the preferences of the population. The same thing applies to Egypt. Yeah, I mean, the, obviously the Arab Spring, um, quote unquote, is a, at best a work in progress. Um, I think the most optimistic view is that maybe we haven't seen the last of the Arab Spring. Um, but regardless, uh, it's clear that the region is in enormous turmoil. Every country virtually in, in the region is, is in internal um, turmoil, and that is a distraction from, from the Palestinian issue, which historically has been a, a source of at least Arab consensus and in terms of the broader uh, Muslim world. Um, so it's just not a priority, really, the Palestinian issue for the, for the Arab public in general or for Arab leaders in particular. So I think the Arab Spring, I think, has uh, also has a parallel on the Palestinian side. There have been manifestations of, of, of this kind of unrest and dissatisfaction with their leadership, both in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, uh, with whether it's the PA or Hamas. We've, we've seen also um, that play out there. And, but I don't see any definitive trend. I mean, what I see is a very fragmented region that's in turmoil uh, with competing priorities. Every state has, uh, particularly the, the key Arab states, Egypt, Jordan, um, Saudi Arabia in particular, all have either internal or regional priorities that outstrip the Palestinian issue. Um, and so they're mainly interested, I think, in keeping a lid on it um, and just sort of putting it on the shelf and not having it be a source of instability uh, and problems. Um, but I don't think they're, in, they're prepared to invest enormous political capital uh, at this time, in part because, they, because they're distracted with their internal problems, but also because I think they look at the Palestinian internal situation and they say, this is such a dysfunctional leadership. Do we really want to invest in Mahmoud Abbas's leadership? What is the future of Hamas and its role? Do we want to invest in a divided PA? Um, uh, what is the future of the PLO? So there are a lot of question marks, and this is why I think it really, it, the, the one factor that will change the regional and possibly also global dynamics will be a shift on the Palestinian side, some sense that a new Palestinian political consensus or vision or strategy is emerging um, that the Palestinian public can rally behind and that 
uh, the Arab world can, can rally behind. But I think as long as you have this fragmented, dysfunctional Palestinian leadership, you know, there's just not a lot of incentive to, to invest there. <coughs> um, in, terms of <coughs> in terms of Russia and other um, big powers, um, I probably, sh I, should have, uh, I should have put it slightly differently in the sense that I don't see any one, uh, one actor that can play the role of the United States. <coughs> I can certainly imagine, in theory, some consortium of big powers and regional powers that might come together and, and together have enough sway with the parties to, to serve as, a, as an interlocutor, as a third party. Um, but that would take a lot of coordination. It would take, we're talking about um, maybe some new quartet or some new successor to the quartet where you've got the Russians and the, the Chinese and maybe India, who knows, uh, maybe regional actors like Turkey, um, certainly Arab states like Egypt and Saudi Arabia. I could imagine a, <coughs> a theoretical um, contact group of some kind that could emerge to, to push that. But all of these places have other priorities. Um, and, and it's not clear to me that you could do that in isolation of the United States. I think one emerging trend is that this administration in particular, if it can't be seen as the address, uh, I think we're likely to see it play the role of a spoiler. I think they, Trump's temperament is such that um, if, if I can't, if, if you won't go for the deal of the century, well, then I will ensure that, that no other um, deal is, is possible. And I think he's doing that for both future uh, generations and also for, uh, in terms of uh, trying to squeeze out other, uh, other parties. But, but at the end of the day, I don't see, um, I don't see the Russians and the Chinese and, and, and the Turks and the Iranians and the Egyptians and Saudis all coming together and agreeing, forging some new international consensus that is going to push this issue forward. I just don't see that. I just don't see that happening. <coughs> I have a quick question for you, Khaled. Um, I think you also has a one in the back. Yeah. Uh, so we have, um, you know, there's been a lot of speculation about the so-called deal of the century. Uh, the administration's kept it pretty much quite secret. Uh, there's a little bit <coughs> of details here and there, but it, I guess it's all just guessing. Um, I guess my first question is, what do you predict will be the terms of it. Uh, I know you touched on it a little bit with Jerusalem and the two-state solution. And I guess more importantly, how do you think the Palestinian leadership will react? Uh, you know, obviously you talk a lot about the uh, power imbalance, so it's not like they have much of a choice, but what do you think, how do you think they'll react to it? And then what will happen? <coughs> yeah, I mean, I my sense is that the Palestinian authority, the Palestinian leadership, Leadership in general is quite um, terrified of of what of of having this plan come out, and I think I think we see also a lot of panic um, on on this side uh, uh, also in terms of a lot of American Jewish groups, um, uh, you know, establishment uh, Democrats and others who still care about a two-state solution are also panicked. Um, they fear that you know all the stars are aligning. Uh, in favor of annexation. Trump is certainly, I mean, Netanyahu has alluded to it and is leaning in that direction. And I think from everything we've seen from, from Trump is that they would probably be okay with formal or informal annexation by, by the Israelis. Um, so there's a lot of panic. There's panic by the Palestinian leadership um, whose raison d'etre really is a two-state solution. Um, and they can't exist uh, as a leadership without at least the possibility of a two-state solution. And I think there's also a lot of panic uh, in, inside American politics too. <clears throat> I, I tend to think that that panic is over, uh, overblown. <clears throat> I don't see a way, I mean, the Palestinians already live under full Israeli control. Um, so the United States rubber stamping Israeli unilateralism uh, first is not that new, but second, is that really different than the status quo? Um, I don't think we're gonna see US Marines arriving in the West Bank to enforce anything. Um, Israel, the IDF does pretty much whatever it wants, 
anyway. So <clears throat> whether it's formally uh, uh, green-lighted or, or approved by the Trump administration doesn't really matter because the reality is that either way you have an is Israeli direct control um, and, and, and no real repercussions uh, for Israel, uh, certainly not from the United States. Uh, we might see repercussions from Europe, uh, from, uh, from civil society uh, in, in various countries, including our own. Um, but I don't, I don't, you know, what's the worst that will happen is uh, I don't see how the Trump administration, especially when it is isolated internationally uh, from straying from the old rules of the peace process, uh, you know, its policy on Jerusalem, it's still an outlier. The United States is an outlier on all of these issues. Occupation, Jerusalem, uh, two-state solution, the United States is, is an outlier. And the fact that it is perfectly aligned with the Netanyahu's government, I think, makes the status quo more durable, but doesn't really change the reality on the ground all that much. <coughs> Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Herod. Among other outlets, I write for the Middle East Forum and in uh, Britain in particular for their um, <coughs> Israel Victory Project, as it's called, the thesis of which is that uh, peace can only result uh, in the region when finally there's a, an Israeli victory that breaks the rejectionist will that's existed for really since the beginning of the Zionist movement to accept the Jewish state of Israel. I mean, in particular, you still have this, as you've referenced, this right of return for refugees that is simply a non-starter for Israel as it would demographically destroy Israel. I mean, should we not pursue a policy of increasing pressures on the Palestinians precisely to, to lead to a situation where you could have some sort of negotiated settlement, uh, however that might be? You, you're, you're asking if we shouldn't actually put more pressure on the Palestinians, yeah, so that, that's the key. <coughs> Shut down who? Yeah, well, obviously Jerusalem has been recognized by the Trump administration, so that's, um, you know, that's not a hypothetical. <coughs> um, uh, shutting down UNRWA is not, uh, is, not, is not a power that the United States has. It has a UN mandate uh, that is renewed uh, by the United Nations. <coughs> it's not something that the United States can do unilaterally. I think if it were to try to do unilaterally, the same as the Jerusalem policy, the same as, you know, not recognize an occupation, um, it would continue to be sort of an outlier. So, uh, yes, if you view the conflict through a, not just an Israeli lens, but a very hard right wing Israeli slash Zionist lens, then, um, then of course, the, the solution is, you know, this is the blind, this is the essence of the blind spot, is if you view every, the world and this conflict through a distinctly Zionist and Israeli lens, you don't see legitimate Palestinian rights. You, that gets filtered out. You don't see Palestinian political aspirations. You don't see Palestinian rights. You don't see, all of those things are fake. Um, and uh, we've seen elements of that in US rhetoric by various, in, at various stages in history. So what you're saying actually isn't new. This whole idea of Israel Victory Project, um, there's, a, there's a, 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 you know, back during, um, in, the in the 1920s when this issue was being debated in Congress, when the whole idea of the Balfour Declaration was being debated in Congress, um, <clears throat> even when Palestinians were the majority, some 90, at least 90 percent of the population, um, and, and everyone agreed that in general people had the right to self-determination, but there was a sort of a carve-out uh, that the majority population in Palestine at the time didn't have that right um, because the land uh, was kind of set aside for a future Jewish national home. This is an ideological position. It's not a, it's a, you know, I think it needs to be understood as that. So if you view the world through this, this ideological lens, then there are certain things that you cannot see. And um, all I can say is uh, the book is an attempt to show those things that someone who can't see them uh, to see. Uh, so I would encourage you to read the book um, and perhaps, um, you know, I, I mean, if, if the book has any value at all, it's in, in highlighting those things that have always been filtered out by the viewpoint that you so well articulated.
I wanted to actually <coughs> respond to that a little bit, actually, because my parents, uh, my grandparents fled uh, their village in the Galilee in 1948. Um, my parents alone, this is my parents, not even my grandparents, they can name eight generations of, of their grandparents that were in there for hundreds of years. Uh, so why would they uh, give up their right to return? That's their <coughs> homeland. They, ha they were forced to flee for various reasons. Uh, there was a massacre in our village, uh, so they had to flee at one point. Uh, and then they went to Lebanon and Syria. Y yeah. Uh, and, and so why should we give up the right to return there? Uh, Mr. Herod, where are you from um, originally in, this in the United States? Minnesota. Minnesota. Okay, so if there was a conflict, um, and then for whatever reason you had to, your family had to leave Minnesota, and then you ended up coming to D.C., uh, would you give up your right to return to Minnesota? <coughs> Yeah, but that doesn't mean they should just give up their ability to go back to their homeland. Uh, Muhammad, can I can I just yeah. weigh on this point, and then maybe sure. we'll, we, if there's time to, to move on to, to another question? But um, I, I would I would put it in this way: I, I find it particularly strange that um, people who generally support the idea uh, that a group of people after two thousand years have retained this attachment to a particular piece of land many, I don't know how many generations are in 2,000 years, but quite a lot. Um, if, 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 if people understand that, if people can relate to that, uh, how is it so unrelatable that people could also have an attachment to their land after 70 years? Um, and so I think it comes down to a question of, on the one hand, just rationality. You know, what you, people are, the, people are, humans are pretty much the same across the board, we have the same impulses, the same uh, motivations. Um, and so if one group of people is so attached to a particular land uh, that they want to return to it after 2,000 years, then it's not that hard uh, to imagine another group of people who would also want to return, um, many of whom actually still remember uh, the land. We're not talking about you know generations that have been totally, uh, totally wiped out. So on the one hand, it's, it's there's a, there's a component of logic to it. On the other hand, it's just a basic question of empathy. If you can't put yourself, uh, if you can't imagine yourself in the shoes of others, um, if you only see other suffering through how it affects you, um, that's, you know, I, I think that's part of the problem. And I think what is changing in American politics is that there is now a growing segment of American uh, public and the electorate that can empathize with Palestinians that does see uh, the issue not just through a distinctively Israeli lens, but through a, a lens that is more universal, uh, universal human rights, universal human dignity, uh, universal values, and, and that's where the real change is happening as opposed to a very narrow, um, tribal, uh, you know, uh, uh, worldview that is based on the exclusive experiences uh, of, of one group to the exclusion of others. <coughs> uh, so I did read the book, and um, congratulations. Uh, Thank you. It's very difficult to go through all the peace process over time and evaluate those plans, so um, a lot of credit to you for your work in doing that. Uh, my question is, uh, it's almost the opposite here, is... Uh, isn't part of the, the blind spot and the legacy of it the complete evisceration of, of international law uh, as it pertains to this conflict? I mean, you have something like these are right of return is a basic principle of international law. You have the Fourth Geneva Convention. It says you can't transfer your population into territory that you occupy. Uh, there are provisions for home demolitions, or how to treat prisoners, um, you know, how medical care, <coughs> humanitarian provisions. Th these kind of things uh, all seem to be overlooked over in the course of this, this, this peace process. And, you know, I could just apply it even to your, uh, you talked about the Oslo process, and, you know, you hear a lot of people going back and forth about was it 96% or was it 92%. I think, I think the main thing is it did not follow principles of international law, 
and it carved out uh, like um, what you would call a matrix of control so that Israel would still con retain control over the borders, over the electromagnetic sphere, water, electricity, so forth. So in a sense, you're repackaging the occupation. It's not, it wasn't meaningful sovereignty. And so th I just, I guess you maybe in your last response, you answered some of this, but the, the legacy of, of international law and the, the meaning of it, it just seems to be watered down now to the point where, um, you know, <coughs> what the Palestinians had to stand on. Yeah, no, I, I think you perfectly summed it up, actually. I, I agree completely. Um, uh, I, I think I would describe the evisceration of international law as a framework for resolving this conflict. That was a gradual process. It didn't happen. Donald Trump didn't come out of nowhere. Um, it, it's unlikely, actually, that if you had three administrations who consistently adhered to international law, that someone like a Donald Trump could have come and done what he did, you know, what he did with regard to Jerusalem and sort of doing away with 242 and all of that. Um, it was the fact that it had, it had been gr uh, gradually eroded that left, uh, you know, that that left uh, the door wide open for Trump to do what he did. So I, um, I, I agree with you. I think it's a manifestation of the blind spot where um, because we don't, because we're not adhering to a set of principles that are fixed and constant and shared, um, we, it's a moving target. And so the peace process uh, is whatever power dynamics uh, shape it to be. Uh, and the power dynamics, of course, are heavily in, in Israel's favor. And so one of the major lessons and takeaways, really, of, of the book is, is that the peace process, as we understood it, Oslo process was shaped at least by as much by its opponents as it was by its supporters. Uh, and that's really important. So when you get things like the Jerusalem Embassy Act, that was a poison pill that was planted in the Oslo process that would, you know, exp you know or landmine that would explode uh, 20 years later. A and it did. And so the peace process was always incorporating all of these contradictions and eventually got to a point which really happened under Obama when those contradictions just were not sustainable anymore and it began to fall apart. Um, and, and what Trump has done is filled the vacuum with, uh, well, he's, he stopped the pretense. You know, I liken it to, the, the metaphor I use is, you know, the past three administrations have spent all these years trying to fit the square peg in the round hole and then uh, here comes Trump and says, you don't need to do that. You just rename the square a circle, okay? And that's it. You don't have to fit it into anything. We just we're just changing the rules uh, entirely, um, and and but that is that is rooted. You know, Trump is empowered by the fact that past presidents have uh, have not adhered to these shared principles that it that that the United States itself had claimed were the be all end all of the peace process. I mean, the whole reason um, there was any dialogue with the PLO, which t it took 20 years. Uh, or more to finally for the United States to talk to the PLO, and it was premised on what? You have to accept UN Resolution 242, right? And here we are some 25, 30 years later, and we ourselves have abandoned uh, Resolution 242. So um, it's not, it, it's not, <coughs> it's, the, it's the American position that keeps um, changing and evolving to match uh, Israel's position. Um, so I agree with you. Khal, I think I agree with that, and I guess you could say actually the Trump administration has been <coughs> more honest than any other administration before. Is um, they don't the rhetoric is actually now there's less pretense. There's less pretense, like yeah. you said. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and in that sense, they've done us a favor. I think they've offered, they've provided some clarity, um, and that's why I'm I'm not so pessimistic about uh, about the future because at the end of the day. Uh, there's a finite set of possibilities. Uh, the status quo is one possibility. That can continue indefinitely. Um, but the status quo becomes more and more untenable politically, if not physically, in major constituencies here in the United States. Uh, more and more people, I think, are calling it apartheid. Um, you cannot talk about permanent. If there's no prospect of ending the occupation because you don't believe that the occupation exists, uh, then the only way you can uh, 
uh, rationalize or understand the idea of one state dominating an entire group that are not citizens of that state uh, is as a form of apartheid. And so, it, you know, this is the double-edged sword of sort of ideologically erasing the occupation uh, and pretending that it doesn't exist. Okay, but the reality of five million Palest human beings, don't call them Palestinians because, you know, they're an invented people. Fine. Five, five, million, Palestin five million human beings who, have no, who are stateless and have no citizenship rights in the state that rules over them, that poses a problem. Um, it's a security problem, it's a legal problem, it's a moral problem, it's a political problem, uh, and there's no, um, there's no kind of um, you know, sleight of hand rhetorically that you can say it's Judea and Samaria. That doesn't erase the reality of five million people who don't have citizenship and uh, who, uh, who are going to demand it. If not in two states, they'll demand it in one. <coughs> Well, you're essentially leading up to the question that I've had all along and that uh, many of your answers uh, have sort of implicitly pointed to. I'm struck over and over again by um, reading that this or that uh, will make the two-state solution impossible. When it seems pretty obvious to me that this two-state solution has been dead for several, for many years, uh, for, uh, for several years at least. And um, and so, well, so why are you know why do we keep even talking about a two-state solution when there are other ways of um, addressing human rights that that human rights law and international law <coughs> provide? <coughs> Sorry, um, why do we keep talking about a two-state solution? I think the answer is simple um, because. Politics and diplomacy hate a vacuum. And even if it's true objectively, normatively, that a two-state solution is not possible politically, physically, um, it's very hard for politicians and diplomats to start talking about an alternative when there's no consensus on what that alternative looks like. So until we have, you know, it took a very long time to, div to create a consensus on a two-state solution. Um, even you know people people forget, but some people refer to the two-state solution now uh, as the only game of town. Well, there was a time when the Palestinians talked about a two-state solution in the 1970s and 80s, and they were laughed out of the room. It's absurd to think you know read Henry Kissinger. The idea of a PLO, st a state run by the PLO, was laughable, <coughs> um, and of course the Israelis would never go for it. Uh, and they didn't go for it for a very long time until, of course, they did. Uh, and then there was a, a sort of this moment in the late 1990s and early 2000s when you had a kind of a political consensus, very precarious one, um, on the Israeli side, on the Palestinian side, in, in American politics around a two-state solution. Um, that political consensus has completely fallen apart. It fell apart in Israel. Um, you know, we, we've, we've watched it. Uh, we've watched it fall apart. And because American politics is very often, or at least a segment of American politics, is so pegged to Israeli politics, Israeli politics shift to the right, we've seen the Republican Party also shift to the right. Um, and so there's a real change in American politics. The Republican Party, you know, Ronald Reagan said, you know, settlements are bad, and, um, you know, he vetoed, and he even threatened uh, Prime Minister Begin uh, 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 with with sanctions when when the Israelis invaded Lebanon, all of these things are completely would be unimaginable in today's in today's context. Um, so the Republican Party itself has evolved from a reasonably pragmatic uh, uh, party to a very ideological party uh, that sees the world in in very distinct um, civilizational terms uh, and and in cultural terms. And that's just where that's just where American politics is. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but but even if it's not possible to have a two-state solution, we we don't yet see a a um, <clears throat> a critical mass, even on the Palestinian side, that is moving toward a one-state solution. I can't um, identify any single Palestinian credible Palestinian political actor that is advocating a one-state solution. Um, there are civil society elements, right? But even if you look, at, you, you know, if you look at 
all the major Palestinian political factions, whether Fatah or the PFLP or Hamas or Islamic Jihad, um, Hamas and Fatah, of course, are the, are the two largest. Um, and even Hamas has sort of, on a de facto basis, accepted the idea of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza based on the 1967 lines, even if it rejects Israel, even if it rejects 242. Um, and so there, you know, how can we move towards that alternative if nobody's calling for it? I don't see anyone on the Israeli, Palestinian, or American side who's calling in a, in a clear and coherent way uh, for, for a one-state solution and has a plan to get us there, as there was you know, with Fatah and the two-state solution since the 1970s. So until we see that emerge, people are going to default to a two-state solution because there's nothing else to hang your hat on. Khaled, thank you so much for your presentation. <coughs> uh, everybody, the book is great, so please purchase a copy on your way out. Thank Thanks you, Mohammed, and thank, thank you all. You.